Let's pray again. Oh, Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, so that we are filled today with faith, faith, faith in you. Amen. So, <coughs> excuse me. Who is the God of your life? Who's the God of your life? The focus of your life, the center of your life. Take a half minute to think about that. How would you describe the God of your life? The God that we worship here at Holy Cross and across our synod and in Christian churches all over the world is the triune God who reveals himself in the scripture as we talked about with the kids. And I pray that we will get to know that God more and more every day throughout our lives. It's the God I hope you worship privately as well. The God of the scripture reveals himself as one of the kids said that is the triune God. That's something, that's a mystery we cannot understand. Bible teaches, and we clearly confess it in our creeds, even though we can't understand it, we believe in the triune God. That's the God we worship, the God we worship. Three persons in one God. Three persons, all equal, all equal in every way. One essence, though, one substance, not three different gods, but one God in three persons. God has God identified himself by various names, Yahweh, which is Hebrew. We translate it usually as Lord, but we can use the Hebrew name as well. El Shaddai, another Hebrew name, translated usually as Lord Almighty. So El Shaddai, great name. There's a song that's sometimes sung of El Shaddai. I am, God said when he's talking to Moses, I am who I am. I am, a name expressing the idea that he's living, he's He's, a, you know, just he is life itself. The Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son are the three persons of the Trinity, triune God. Let's highlight that a little bit. Again, the scriptures, the God of the scriptures reveals himself as a triune God. Three persons, and each person of the Trinity is fully God, fully God in that each one has all of the attributes of God. We're going to go through those attributes after a while. Therefore, each person is God, but each person is not the Godhead. The Godhead refers to the three of them together. So, Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but they are not individually the Godhead. They're the Godhead together. Again, not three gods, one God. One essence, one substance. Trey of God is certainly a mystery that we cannot understand, right? But we teach it based on the scriptures. We believe it based on the scriptures, even though we cannot understand it. We believe it. The triune God, again, reveals himself as a living God. He demonstrates that he is living by his work in the world and, of course, in our lives, right? For example, God is sovereign. He's totally self-sufficient. He's not dependent on anyone. Sovereign means he's totally above everything else, okay? He's in charge. And he shows that in the, in the Word, in, the, in God's Word, that he's able, he's active, he's all-powerful. You know, for example, he created everything, right, out of nothing. Scriptures teach us that. On a couple occasions, he shows his power by stopping the rotation of the world. And in one case, actually, when someone says, well, you know, can you turn it backward? Can you make time go backward? And it did. He raises up and deposes rulers. He foretells the future and makes it happen. He provides for us. And if we think about that in a time like this of the year, right? We see the trees blossoming, all the fruit trees. They're going to bear fruit. We see the bushes that bear fruit, blueberries, etc. We see seeds we put in the ground that grow up, right? We cut apart a potato and put it in the ground, and it puts up a big plant, and all of a sudden you got half dozen to potatoes in the ground, all those ways. Those are all miracles of God. God created that. God created that. That's his power. God, of course, is gracious. He rescues us sinful human beings. He did it. He did the unimaginable, really. It wasn't just, you know, he didn't have to just pay some money or do something. Well, he did something, but it was sacrificing himself to save us. Think about that. God himself sacrificing himself 
to save us sinful human beings. He rescued us from our self-destruction in our path to destruction, path to hell, eternity in hell. He gave us this most precious gift, eternal life with him. The opposite of that, of course, is eternal life, eternal death or eternal separation from God in all the misery and suffering of hell, along with the devil and his demons. Now, other gods throughout history are certainly not what the true God is. Other gods are fictitious. They are man-made. They are people's, from people's imagination. They are not living. That other god label, of course, applies to other gods beyond the one and only true God. False gods like the god I mentioned in the kid's message, Dagon or Baal or Moloch or Ashtoreth, you know, gods that were worshipped at that time in history. Later, of course, we have the Greek and Roman gods, which, which we call mythological gods, because they are. They're just, they're fictitious. People saw that, hey, some god must be helping these plants grow, and they named a god that they said would do that. Well, that's the true god who's doing that, but they imagined it to be a false god. Buddhists, Buddhists have Buddha, of course. The Hindus have hundreds of gods, as I understand it, like Brahma and Vishnu and Shiva, etc. Allah, the god of the Muslims. These gods are all lifeless, lifeless. They never were alive. They have no position, no status, no hierarchy in the living, okay? They don't exist, except in the minds of the people that follow them. They have no being, no, no status except as an idol, something imaginary or something that someone creates an image of. As we see, for example, the Buddhists have, a, have statues of Buddha, etc. They are totally, these false gods are totally dependent on the people who believe in them. You know, like Dagon, he couldn't get himself up off the floor. People had to pick him up, prop him up. These false gods are not capable of control. They have control over nothing. They're inactive. They're unable, not able to do anything. Here's a critical understanding that we need to recognize. In the minds of the people who worship false gods, these gods are taskmasters that they must appease. The followers of all these other gods perceive that they have to merit goodness from their God through sacrifices or rituals or payments or other kinds of uh, works. Think about the contrast. The real living God, the real living God, the God of the Bible, rescues us, doesn't he? We don't appease him. He rescues us sinners. In every other religion, every other religion throughout the history of the world, the false gods the people perceive they have to appease their God. Luther made that distinction, and it's one that we hold to, to, the, every, this, to this day. You will not find any other religion other than Christianity in which God saves people. In others, you have to save yourself by getting in good with your God. Let me contrast once God and false gods. Again, God is sovereign. True God is sovereign. Self-sufficient, dependent on no one. He's above all. He's in control of all. You know, false gods, they don't exist. They have no status. They don't control anything, except in the minds of people who believe in them. God is able. He's all-powerful. He's active. You know, false gods, inactive, incapable. God is gracious, reaching out to us humans with his love to rescue us. False gods don't do that. They can't do that. But in the minds of followers, again, they must be appeased to get in their favor. We can go on with all the list of attributes of God. And I want to do that today. And I hope you remember this list. Write them down. Remember these. Because when we know God's attributes, we can worship God for those attributes. For example, God is totally capable, totally capable. There are no limits to what God can do. He's the ultimate in Many different, for example, on the screen you see there, he's totally, he's almighty. He's all-powerful. He's omnipotent, different words that we use there. He can do anything he desires to do. Nothing is impossible for God. 
He's all seeing. He sees everything around the whole universe. He's seeing it simultaneously. He's all knowing. He knows everything. He's present everywhere. And we can't, we can't understand that, can we? But it's true. We believe it based on the Bible. He's all wise. He understands. He knows the future. And he makes decisions based on what he knows about the future. The false gods are none of those, right? The true God is holy. That is, he's perfect, perfect, sinless, perfectly righteous. He's just. That is, he's fair, he's impartial, totally just. He's faithful. He keeps his promises. And he's eternal, he's with belt beginning, without end. And that's something we can't imagine, can we? You know, kids often ask in confirmation class, when did God come into being? Well, he's always been there. He's always been there. We can't, we can't fathom that. But the false gods are none of those, right? They're not holy. They're not just. They're not faithful. They can't be. They're not alive. And finally, the true God is merciful. That is, he's full of pity. He withholds from us the punishment we deserve. And he's gracious. He's forgiving. He gives us what we don't deserve, namely forgiveness. Often in the Old Testament, we see he's merciful, he's gracious, merciful and gracious, words to hang on to withholding the punishment we deserve and giving us the gift of love, gift of forgiveness that we don't deserve. And, of course, his love is sacrificial, it's selfless, and is compassionate. Compassionate not just in terms of our sin, but in terms of our whole lives. We see these attributes not just in the Bible. They're not just, you know, a list in the Bible that we memorize. We see them in the life of the Bible. We see them in our own lives too, don't we? Yes. False gods are none of those, again. Now, most of us would say, I hope, that all of you say, I don't worship any of those false gods, and that's good, okay? But I want to throw out a caution here this morning, because in modern America, where as our society becomes more diverse, including people from nations where other religions are dominant, we certainly want to accept the people from other countries as they come to America. But we dare not accept their gods as equal choices. Does that make sense? Yeah, you know, we want to accept the people, but we don't want to accept their gods as, okay, well, that's just another god. We're worshiping the same god. No, no, that's not true. Not true at all. The god that reveals himself in the Bible is a triune god. He graphically expresses his love for us. False gods are nothing. They can't do that. They can't do that. So we need to separate. There's a true god. And there are also all kinds of false gods. There's great danger in what many in our culture are already believing and promoting, namely that it's all really just the same God. We're just worshiping different, the same God by different names. Not true. Again, the distinction I made before between the God of the Bible, who is a gracious God who rescues us, all other fictitious gods, you serve your God to get in his favor in some way. So there's also great danger in the thought that is often expressed in our culture that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe sincerely. You really believe it. That's not true either. Great danger also in believing that all religions will get you into heaven. It doesn't matter what religion it is. They'll all get you into heaven. Again, that's promoted widely in our culture. That's not true. You need the one and only true God who reveals himself in the Bible. You trust in him. You rely on him. He is the rescuer. Now, as I said a minute ago, you probably would all say, I don't worship any of those false gods. But I want you to listen carefully because that other god label also applies to the gods that the devil cleverly puts on as a front for himself. The God of pleasure, the God of recreation, the God of success or status, the God of romance or relationship or the person in that relationship, the God of possessions or even the God of family. Those are fronts that the devil puts on, you know. They're false gods, and if we're worshiping them, we're worshiping the devil. Whatever is the center of our lives, or the focus of our lives, or the love of our lives, is our God. Think about that. Whatever is the focus of our lives, the desire of our lives, the center of our lives, the love of our lives, 
That's our God. So you see how deceiving and subtle the devil is. It's a lot easier to recognize a false god if we had a big statue here, right? They say, well, that's a false god. It's a lot more difficult for us to recognize that we're loving our God. Excuse me, we're loving our job, for example, above the triune God. We're loving our family above our God. We're loving our recreation above our God. It's more difficult to recognize that, isn't it? But we all need to examine ourselves. What really is the center of our lives? And I hope you say, God is. The triune God is the center of my life. I hope you work to make it stay that way, stay that way. The problem isn't just in our neighbors. You know, we maybe see, yeah, they, that's the focus of their lives. But we need to examine our own hearts and defend against that danger of worshiping other things in our lives besides the train of God. So what is our focus? What is it we wrap ourselves around? What, is it we de what are we devoted to? What is it we love? Truthfully, the devil promotes all these other things. Pleasure, recreation, success, status, possessions, downtime. You know, downtime away from godly pursuits. In our sinful nature, which all of us have, are inclined to follow these other gods, aren't we? We're inclined because of our sinful nature to follow these other gods. So please, please, please pursue the true God, the right God, the triune God, every day, every day. Let me urge you to pray daily that the true God would be the number one priority of your life. You know, put up reminders. Maybe put a sticker on your mirror, on your closer or whatever, urging you to pray. Pray today, Lord, that you would be the number one priority. And then follow through with your daily activities. Actually work at making him the priority of your lives. Let me share something that our lead team has talked about here at Holy Cross. This question, this topic, do we here at Holy Cross encourage people to take a break from God by our summer programming or our lack of it? You know, we continue our Sunday worship, but we, we discontinue our Sunday morning education hour. And I hear that most life groups don't meet in the summer. It's nice to have a change of pace, but are we signaling that families should take a break from God? Hope you find ways to stay very focused on God, even though there's a change of pace personally for your family. We certainly are continuing our Sunday worship. We'll have a Tuesday morning and Tuesday evening Bible class. There'll be a women's Bible class starting in July. There's kids' Bible camp. There's a confirmation trip to Creation Museum and the Ark, a teen mission trip and father and son's retreat. And I hope your life group continues to meet. More of our staff, of course, will be taking some vacations this summer because it's so difficult to get away September through May. But please remember that we are saved people of God. We're saved. We're saved. We have a God who rescued us. And again, let me warn you that the gods of this century, you know, pleasure, recreation, status, possession, etc., are false gods. They're as false as Buddha and Allah and Zeus and etc., they won't do us any good. Neither will the gods of pleasure, recreation, job, money, vacations. The true God is our creator. He's our provider. He's our protector. He's the Savior who made it possible for us to have eternal life. He's the God who rescued us, the Spirit of God who rescued us and works in us continually to keep us on the path to eternal life. So God has chosen you, chosen you to be his forever. Hang on to him. Hang on to him. And let me, to, let me urge you also to acknowledge that, yes, you are pulled away to worship other gods. Again, probably not Dagon, Baal, etc. But we are pulled away to worship other things in this world. Pray. Pray. Express your trust in God daily and ask him to... Push you away from anything that would drag you away from him. Let me urge you to pray regularly this prayer. O oh Lord God, Father, Son, and Spirit, 
Give me an undivided heart that's totally attached to you. Help me trust you and your word fully. Help me love you above all people and things and help me revere you as my creator, my provider, my protector, my savior, and my sanctifier and enabler. Help me make you my number one priority. Would you pray that with me? Just reading it off the screen. Pray it from your heart. Oh, Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, give me an undivided heart that is totally attached to you. Help me trust you and your word fully. Help me love you above all people and things. And help me revere you as my creator, provider, protector, my savior, and my sanctifier and enabler. Help me make you my number one priority. Amen. Again, I urge you to make that your number one prayer every day. Trust the living God, the true God. Devote your life to following him wholeheartedly. And daily acknowledge your sinfulness, your sin, and then thank God for Jesus and praise Jesus. Amen. And all God's people say, Amen. May God, who has begun this good work in you, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, the day of his resurrection. Amen. Amen.